be anything but uneventful. Prototype number one had not been in the air long when its chase plane noticed what seemed to be smoke coming from the aircraft. In fact, it was hydraulic oil leaking under pressure. Within minutes, all of the control surfaces of the plane ceased to function as the pilots made their approach through the cold morning air. feet from the ground when there was no possible likelihood that the plane would reach the runway the pilots ejected four seconds later prototype number one ceased to exist here is how it looked from the ground camera recording the event In late August, another aircraft, originally scheduled as number 12, now redesignated 1X as a replacement of the ill-fated original prototype, was wheeled out of Grumman's Calverton plant. By now, Smythe, Miller, and the other test pilots had established a real affinity for what Grumman was convinced was the answer to the Navy's problem. But other manufacturers and the natural pessimism of Congress had yet to be overcome. And while the Navy had confidence in the Tomcat concept, there were still many trials ahead. Because at no stage was Model 303 to be a cheap aircraft. The sort of money invested and the commitment necessary were already putting Grumman under considerable pressure. Throughout 1971, ground-based testing of the first prototypes continued. These aircraft were put through severe testing when little was known about how they would react. 
Here is prototype number two with a complete ordnance load achieving the almost unachievable. Here it is again, affecting an induced stall. Throughout the entire prototype program, several aircraft were made with no intention of ever being flown. Their sole purpose was to be tested to destruction. By this method, it was hoped that any flaws in design or manufacture would be identified. Prior to carrier testing, a prototype was catapult tested at Patuxent River Naval Air Station. And on June 28, 1972, the first Tomcat flown by a Navy pilot landed on the aircraft carrier Forrestal off Norfolk. After a series of touch and goes, the landing was affected by aircraft number 10. But within minutes, a small malfunction appeared. The two pilots were informed of a leak in the hydraulics of the nose gear. On hand as a minor adjustment was made was Bill Miller. look on the faces of the Navy's test pilot said everything, because this film of the first carrier landing was to be flown to the Congressional Committee for a final decision on the Tomcat within hours. As it happened, the committee gave the project full endorsement, but elation at Grumman was short-lived, because just 24 hours later, Bill Miller's luck ran out. Flying this same aircraft, he made a minor technical oversight that cost him his life. You bump into a lot of situations out on the carrier where there is not a cut and dried set of rules and there's not a cut and dried set of policies that say the carrier guarantees me that I will have these conditions on landing. You're going to go out there and you're going to fly and when you come back you're going to look for where the carrier is supposed to be regardless of where they told you it was going to be. You're going to look for where it really is and then whatever the conditions are you're going to land on it. If you come back and the weather doesn't suit your minimums it really doesn't matter. That's the only place you have to land. And so therefore, you may have to bend the weather a little bit. Uh, that doesn't happen often, but it is, it's, it's an example of the, the, the sort of difference that you see between the way the Navy has to operate and the way the Air Force has to operate. By late 1972, full-scale production of the F-14 was in progress. The Tomcat was no longer a prototype. It was now the Navy's fighter of the future. The spectacular firepower of the F-14 was spotlighted in Operation 6-on-6. Six six. Roger. 
Runway 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 runway